<clears throat> Hi. So I, I didn't get to do, introduce Dr. Schwartz um, first because they're those two presentations um, were linked together, but she did a nice job of introducing herself. Um, so my name again is Ellen Elias, and I'm um, going to be giving you the final talk of this session. Um, if you can please um, bring those slides up. I am um, a specialist in genetics and, uh, and also a um, group of uh, neurologic disorders called uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities. I'm board certified in those specialties. And I'm a professor of pediatrics and genetics at the University of Colorado. And I direct um, the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome Center of Excellence located at Children's Hospital um, Colorado. Um, so, and I'm looking for my clicker, here it is. Uh, I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So um, I'm going to um, be mentioning a couple of things similarly to what was discussed by Dr. Schwartz, but with a little bit of a different focus. Um, so there are actually now 14 types of EDS, not 13, and, but with the hypermobile form of EDS, uh, that is still a clinical criteria that's necessary to make that diagnosis because there is not one definitive um, gene identified to cause hypermobile EDS. And the other thing that's really important to note um, as a pediatrician, this is important for me, is that the clinical criteria that were published and defined um, by the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics in uh, that 217 series of papers were based on adult features. And younger children, as Dr. Schwartz so very nicely described, particularly if they are pre-pubertal, present quite differently than older pediatric patients and adults. So, whoops, I thought I went the right way. I get stuck. Okay. So, um, there's currently an international consortium working very hard on developing pediatric criteria to diagnose hypermobile EDS. And this work is not yet published. Um, it will be soon, I'm hoping. And I was part of that group. Um, but I um, wanted to share some important points um, from um, the work that we have been doing to identify these features, particularly in children. So Dr. Schwartz mentioned age six. Um, many of us believe that actually five um, is a cutoff. Um, and um, when you're younger than age five, because you have natural hypermobility, it's really not possible to use the bite and scale in the same way you can do it with older patients um, and adults. Um, and so the bite and score is higher and in prepubertal children, must be um, greater or equal to six out of nine in the younger children. So um, I was so glad that this um, presentation this morning started with talking about obstetrical issues. Because as a pediatrician, I need to think about those. What happened um, during the pregnancy um, that has led to this uh, birth of this child that might have uh, important information to share for me as I'm thinking about, could this patient have Ehlers-Danlos? And so as a pediatrician and particularly a geneticist, I always ask about the pregnancy. Um, so was there any history of spotting or bleeding during the pregnancy? Uh, has the mother had a history of any prior miscarriage? Was that baby born prematurely? And were there any um, concerns about excessive bleeding at the time of delivery of the baby? And those are kind of clues for me that a connective tissue disorder might be present. And I spend a lot of time getting good information about other members of the family. Because uh, uh, these are genetic disorders. Most of them are autosomal dominant, as has been mentioned previously. Um, so if a parent has it, there's a 50-50 chance with each pregnancy that you might pass on 
that same gene. One of the important things to realize, though, with autosomal dominant disorders is there can be a spectrum of how severe the symptoms might be. So a child might not be exactly like the parent, even though they might have the same gene variant. So I ask, is there anybody else in the family who has Ehlers-Danlos? How about other connective tissue disorders that might have some overlap in features, including some of the other forms of EDS? And then two other connective tissue disorders called Marfan and Loewy's Dietz syndrome, because there are, there's an overlap in presentation between these. I also ask about a family history of any abnormalities in the aorta, um, uh, or if there's any um, bleeding difficulties, um, is there a family history in the grandmother or any aunts um, of multiple miscarriages? <clears throat> so um, Dr. Schwartz gave a very nice presentation about hypotonia and the fact, uh, 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 joint hypermobility and the fact that it's very difficult to um, figure out if this is pathologic or not because young children tend to be very hypermobile. One of the things she did not mention is that many children can also have a low muscle tone or hypotonia. Um, and children who are very hypotonic tend to be hypermobile as well. They go together. And in children, there are literally thousands of causes of hypotonia that can be determined on a number of variety of different genetic tests that I can order. And so what I'm trying to discern in, in my mind when I'm seeing the child as both a geneticist and a specialist in neurodevelopmental disabilities is, is the hypotonia unusual? Is it more severe? And does it go along with anything else? Does the child have developmental disabilities or behavioral problems along the autism spectrum? Because if those things are present along with the hypotonia and the joint hypermobility, I need to worry about the possibility of another whole group of diagnoses altogether. There's one particular diagnosis called Fragile X syndrome, which is the most common cause of autism in, in um, boys. And that requires a special DNA test to confirm. It's not on any of the other kind of tests that have been previously mentioned. And it's, so if I see a child with autism, developmental disabilities, especially if it's a little boy, I need to make sure that Fragile X has been evaluated for. And there are um, so many other causes of developmental delay, hypotonia, plus minus autism, that I need to switch gears and think about um, other things in the differential diagnosis of that combination of factors. So joint findings in young children um, can involve other joints that are not on the bite and scale. So they can involve shoulders, they can involve hips. Um, and, uh, and so a bite and scale is not that always helpful for me when I'm looking at young children. And children, because they're, they're very um, flexible, they can sometimes pop joints in and out but they can be popped right back in and often don't need any surgical or medical intervention for that. And my experience um, with my patients, almost 500 now in my program, is that the pain factor is less of a problem in the younger child um, than it is in my post-pubertal girls. Um, and that the majority of my pre-pubertal patients with um, hypermobile EDS are pretty active and maybe quite athletic children who participate very nicely in sports and gymnastics and dance um, without having their joint hypermobility interfere with those activities. I wanted to say something about fractures uh, and hypermobile EDS because there have been families who've been falsely accused of child abuse when they have a, a, a child with um, hypermobile EDS. And that's because the bruising may be um, more common, and you've heard that before this morning. Um, but fractures are a different story. Now, it turns out that um, there's a condition called osteogenesis imperfecta, brittle bone disease, to the layperson. Um, and I'm the medical director of the clinic for kids with osteogenesis imperfecta, called OI for short. In my hospital, the vast majority of patients with OI 
um, have mutations in collagen 1, either collagen 1A1 or 1A2. And when I see those children, um, and they're often identified as babies or very young children because of their fractures, what I started to notice is when those patients, especially on the mild end of OI, went through puberty, then they started to develop a lot of the associated factors, um, uh, comorbidities that you see in kids with hypermobile EDS when you're post-pubertal. And so it is very possible, and I've seen it quite often now, that a person with OI and a collagen 1 variant can also meet criteria for hypermobile EDS. So my, my thought is when I'm seeing especially a family who's been um, assessed for or being assessed for the possibility of child abuse, especially if there are fractures involved, is that I need to test and look for the genes known to cause OI, which can also be associated with joint hypermobility. You've heard a lot about the skin this morning, and I, um, and I don't want to belabor that because you've already heard quite a bit about it from Dr. Schwartz, but I was just going to mention that in young children, the skin often feels very soft and velvety, can be mildly stretchy, and wounds, just the normal childhood wounds, can take longer to heal, and scars may appear unusual. And that easy bruising thing is important for parents to understand so they can share with providers that this is something to be expected um, in a child with um, EDS. Um, the comorbidities, which many, many patients have with hypermobile EDS, the, the chronic pain, the fatigue, the dysautonomia, um, can be seen um, in, in children throughout your childhood, but more often than not, they get worse, or they might not even start until after puberty. And we feel, and, and there's some research going into better understand this, that female hormones play a role um, in the, the severity of the symptoms and, um, and their onset. And most of the patients that we see in my hypermobile clinic are female. And the symptoms tend to worsen during periods. Um, and I talk a lot about menstrual suppression with my patients if they're interested in that. And then um, many of these are, are girls who were pretty healthy and active when they were younger, and then things really started um, uh, to become more problematic after the onset of their period called menarche. I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about gastrointestinal problems in young children. This is a particular um, area of interest uh, to me. Um, and it's important to know because these problems do start as early as infancy and in the young children, even if they're too young to be uh, assessed for hypermobile EDS, they can still have these GI problems. And these include feeding problems that can lead to failure to thrive, um, constipation that can be pretty bad. And then there's a subset of these kids who have many, many allergies to multiple different foods and can develop a special problem called eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease. So feeding disorders are very common in pediatrics altogether. They sometimes can be so severe that some of my patients need special high-cal formulas or feeding tubes. Um, uh, not every child with a feeding disorder has a connective tissue disorder, um, but sometimes they do. Um, and they can lead to nutritional deficiencies that I can treat. And I love things that I can treat, because as a geneticist, I, I can't cure many things that I see. But I can sure treat iron deficiency. I can sure treat vitamin D deficiency. I can sure treat low zinc, which causes a poor appetite. And so it's important for me to look for these things. So multiple food allergies can go along with a condition called eosinophilic esophagitis. This is a new problem in pediatrics. I didn't learn about it when I was a peds resident. These are kids that have symptoms that look like they have reflux, but it's really related to significant inflammation inside in their GI tract, and you need to do a scope and do biopsies under anesthesia to make this diagnosis by seeing too many eosinophils on the biopsy. 
The treatment for EOE is different than the treatment for other GI disorders. You have to take out any of the foods in the diet these kids are allergic to. We give them a special medications. And this is a treatable condition, but if you do not treat it, it can last well into adulthood. There are now well over 90 genes associated with eosinophilic disease, and we are planning to do more research on the association between eosinophilic disease and um, hypermobile EDS. And patients with um, eosinophilic disease can also have mast cell activation syndrome at the same time. So in terms of other diseases, you've already heard about collagen-3 causing vascular EDS, collagen-5 causing classic EDS, and collagen-1, which, is, which can cause both uh, um, OI and EDS. And we've known since the 90s that collagen genes are important um, as a cause of EDS. Not just one gene, but multiple. There's another gene called tenacin XB, which was a uh, sort of discovered in some research being done on my campus and some of my patients and their families. And we know about this gene, which in the old days they thought just caused um, classic EDS. We know now that if you just have one um, mutation in tenacin XB, you can have hypermobile EDS. But if you have two variants, one from each parent, you can have such severe disease that you actually can have intestinal failure. Um, okay, um, uh, there are some patients that have severe neurologic disorders that actually don't have EDS. They have neurologic diseases. So, uh, these are quite rare neuromuscular disorders um, related to other kinds of collagen. It's a different form of collagen. Collagen 6 and collagen 12 are the genes that I've seen in uh, some of my patients now who present with severe muscle weakness and abnormal reflexes. And we need to look more carefully at those um, patients who have neurologic findings that are more severe than one would expect to see in a typical child. So to summarize, pediatric patients present differently than older children who have gone through puberty. That pediatric criteria will be very important to establish, to better define how children present with hypermobile EDS. There seems to be a role of uh, female hormones in terms of the onset and severity of disease. And pediatric patients can present very often with GI symptoms, including feeding problems and this esophage, uh, eosinophilic disease I mentioned, and that there are many, many, many diseases that all can cause the clinical presentation of hypermobile EDS. This is an area of intense research, not just in my um, program, but all over the world. And I think we will get there and with all of this intense um, energy and, and research. And um, I listed at the end of my presentation uh, a number of resources for you if you're interested in lo um, looking at medical papers. So thank you very much for your attention.